Okay, how are you guys? What's up, Choose Jesus? How are you, buddy? Just started. Let's see. I don't know. Maybe no one's going to show up. It's going to be just you and me. I want to get to a thousand. I'm going less, uh, getting less and less because I'm. Pray for me by the power of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus Christ. I can be bold as a lion, but also more patient. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father, Spirit. Everything okay defending Christianity? You doing good? It says we have 11 watching, but only see two people. <laughs> okay, then. It says 12 are watching. They're all hiding. hiding. St. Dennis. Please, Sam, please, can you read the article on someone? Time? I don't know what article you're talking about, St. Dennis. St. Dennis, you're going to hurt me. I have nearly a dozen articles in Psalm 110 refuting all the major objections against the messianic interpretation of Psalm 110 and the claim that Psalm 110 points to a non-divine, merely human Messiah. So you're killing me, St. Dennis. Are you ready, reading my articles? Right? We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ and fill us with the Holy Spirit. You've also read my articles on answeringislamblog.wordpress.com because I have articles on Psalm 110 and answeringislam.net and answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. Greetings, everyone. Hopefully today we'll have a blessed time, an anointed time filled with the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ, interpret Scripture correctly as the Holy Spirit enables me, empowers me, to recall scripture perfectly, interpret correctly for the glory of Jesus Christ, Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit, and then give us the power to obey the word, to love the word, to proclaim the word, the word of truth, the Holy Bible. Live out the word for the glory of Jesus Christ and die for it. All right? Okay, welcome, everyone. I'm just waiting for my guy, Protestant, to show up and others, and we'll do a session. I was asked a question by <clears throat> Choose Jesus. He's Keldani, even though he's a Syrian. He's here about my correction my correcting him for saying that satan took a third of the angels how many of you have been taught that satan took a third of the angels with him in his fall god bless you too jeremy hey k hart is that what your prophet used to dine on he was full of it too it came out of his ear and in his mouth and like a dog, you're going to return to your vomit, k -hard. See? The sons of Satan come out. Demonized, demon-possessed children of Satan come out because the demons in them are riling them up. We're covered by the holy blood of Jesus Christ, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, purified in the blood of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit. All right. Now, I put it on 360 resolution because it seems to work best at 360. So let's pray that by the grace of Jesus Christ, the connection will remain solid. Look at it. Someone's calling me. Let's see this. Hello. This is an important message regarding your current... This is how important it is. <laughs> Guys, I'm... I'm barely making 100, and I'm getting very jealous of David Wood. He's been doing this 10 years, and yet his live streams, he gets about 1,000. Come on, man. Why should he get that many, not me? Because he's been doing it for much longer. That was called interception, choose Jesus. <clears throat> As we wait for Morpheus to show up. <clears throat> oh, so I'm not funny, Edmund Dantes. He's funny. But you're funny smelling. Much love, big brother. I don't want to interrupt this man from Is there any way you can send questions that you can? Yeah, the best way to send questions is either on my social media pages like Facebook or uh, via email. And by the grace of God, by the grace of the Triune God, by the grace of the Father, the Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, I'll answer all major questions and objections in due course as long as the Lord Jesus keeps me holy, filled with the Spirit, to be in love with Him, not to be a hypocrite, but to truly be a doer of His Word, to truly love Him by my actions gives me the health that I need and provides financially and protects me from all these attacks, I'll be here. Because Jesus doesn't need me, I need him. But I'll be here. How you doing, guys? Thank you, Kay Johnson. God bless you. I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive and attack people, but you know the policy, right? 
If you ask sincere questions, I'll answer. But if you keep pressing me with a question I've answered, that's one of two things. Let me just help you. If I answer a question more than once and you still ask me the question, one of two things means, one of two things means that you're not getting it. So put it on the shelf. Stop focusing on it. Please hear me out. You need to learn this because it's the Holy Spirit of the living God that enables any one of us, every one of us to understand. There are things I don't understand, I don't get, because the Holy Spirit is not pleased to allow me to get it now. He may enable me to understand it later. So shelve it. Or you don't like the answer, you just want to debate me. If you don't like the answer, don't debate me. This is not a debate session. You can set up a debate. We'll debate. But when I'm teaching, I want sincere questions and people giving me them their undivided attention. Not for me. I'm nothing. For the glory of Jesus, because we're preaching the word of Jesus Christ, right? <clears throat> right so help me to help you don't let me stumble and cause you to stumble well i've written an article Hali mckay on who melchizedek is and melchizedek is not a pre-human appearance of the lord jesus christ i need your prayers god will make me holy radically in love with jesus obeying jesus serving jesus serving you for the sake of jesus and again guys i'm a full-time ministry as as is david wood and others pray for the support to come in pray more people partner with me Without any strings attached. In other words, I depend on Jesus Christ to provide, and he provides to his people. But sometimes people think that if they're contributing to the ministry, that somehow that means I have to jump through, you know, hoops. So that I, if I don't talk a certain way or act a certain way, then they threaten to cut off their support. If you're one of those, I don't need your support. I don't. All I need, all you need is Jesus to provide. And if Jesus wants us to be homeless, even in our homelessness, we will worship him and love him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And even then he'll sustain us. Right? But if you want to give sincerely to the work without any strings attached, then God bless you. And even if you don't want to give, God bless you still for his glory. Right? But again, we're in full-time ministry. So by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, it, God works through the people. So I need to get more supporters and in time i know i will so we can just focus on studying reading writing teaching and living out for the glory of christ because again wow walter you just did what i said not to do and you're out of here see i don't need people like you dude you are an agent of satan wicked stumbling block man okay don't worry Dan and Roach, I think it's because we live at a time where people don't have faith, the faith that they had in previous generations. I just started. You're not missing much. Because the kind of Christians we're producing. Now, let me qualify that. This is typically in the West, in America and Europe, because the kind of Christians we're producing are wishy-washy Christians, quite effeminate Christians, who don't have the power of the Holy Spirit anymore. That's not everyone. I'm not trying to say everyone's like that. But you do hear about miracles, supernatural phenomena taking place in all these other parts of the world, in Africa and Iran, dreams, visions, miraculous healings. So God is still active in doing miracles, showing himself to be more real than we can imagine, bringing people to Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Yeah, this guy. Potato, la, la, la. Listen, why don't you wipe out your mother for giving a birth birth to a dog like you, a filthy rabid dog like you? She needs to be punished for that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. All right. We're just waiting for a few more faces. Hopefully we'll get over 100. Edmund Dantes, since I'm not a Roman Catholic, I don't believe in every reported miracle <clears throat> that takes place in the Catholic Church. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe there are true believers in every major branch of Christianity, but I don't believe everything miraculous <clears throat> is necessarily of God, right? So when you say the son in Fatima, I'm not convinced. Again, I don't want to speak presumptuously. I don't want the Lord Jesus to be angry with me. I'm not convinced that's necessarily of God, right? So I just want to be clear, and I people keep misunderstanding this. If I'm wrong in any doctrine, I beg the Holy Spirit to show me my error. Give me the grace to humble myself to correct that error and accept the fullness of his truth. That means Catholicism. 
then the Holy Spirit will guide me. If it's orthodoxy, the Holy Spirit will guide me. If it's the Nestorian Church, the Holy Spirit will guide me. So far, I've been convinced that the Bible affirms sola scriptura and sola fide. I've heard the best of all sides, and I'm convinced more than ever that the Bible teaches you are justified by faith alone apart from works, and that scriptures are the only infallible rule of faith, the ultimate norm, meaning that of all authorities that we have, scripture is the ultimate authority that subjects all other authorities to itself because it's the voice of God to the church. So anything that diverges from that, that doesn't mean there aren't true believers in these various branches. There are, just like you have false Christians in Protestant denominations. You have false Christians in all other denominations. And you have true believers born in spirit in all these major branches of Christianity. Exactly, Ray Raymond Gator. Yeah. There is not many doing what you do. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Lee. Well, keep praying that I can't. I can do it with more love, more compassion, more grace and, grace and patience. Because as you can see, I struggle. Hey, I've said I'm going to say it again. I am not perfect. I get angry. I'm impatient. Right? I used to, Dan, Dan Roach, but I can't. I, one time I could say I was a five-point canvas. I can't say that anymore. So, Dan Roach, I, upon further reflection and study, I've rejected a lot of it. Now, obviously, the Calvinists are going to say, well, it's because you rejected it because you're ignorant and you don't know the scriptures. That's fine. Like I said, here's my prayer. Well, well hold on, Walter. Were you attacking me? You confused me. Walter, were you attacking me earlier? Yeah, because you are an agent of Satan if you're going to attack and cause division. When I just said don't do that. But first, were you attacking me? Oh, I'm sorry, brother. You didn't say I'm quick to attack Christians? That wasn't directed at me? You sure? Are you telling me the truth? Hold on, hold on, man. I thought he was attacking me. Can you forgive me, brother? I'm sorry. I thought you... See, this is the problem with the text. I thought you were attacking me. Can you forgive me, bro? I'm sorry, man. Oh, why was he attacking you? Wait, hold on. He's one of my mods. Why were you attacking him, Walter? Okay, let's do this. Can we not attack each other? I didn't know. Listen, this is... The, guys, let me tell you something. For the past week, I've had Protestants, Orthodox Catholic attack me and try to cause me to stumble. So I have been very quick to the trigger to block people. Right? I don't know why he called you true. Now, Pro, look, I know Protestant... Uh, man, your name. I keep wanting to call you Protestant Reformer. He's a Protestant believer. He's a dear brother who's dear to my heart, one of my closest brothers of my love, by the grace of Jesus Christ. So if he's calling you a troll, I suspect you did something. I'm not trying to justify anything, but I don't see him calling people trolls. He's not like me or CP. They're trigger happy. Somebody's trigger happy. Repentance is the flip side of faith. But Goose, you got to explain what you mean by repentance because there's people. Robert, Ra Rabbit, okay, I thought you were a rabbi. It's Rabbit Wolf. Does Loris K want to come back, Rabbit Wolf? Because she was being a little argumentative yesterday. You got to explain what you mean. You got to explain what you mean when you say repentance. Guys, we're about to begin on Psalm 110. Yeah, I had to block you the other day, first last. But first last, I trust you. You're a mod. You're also. First last and Protestant believer are two of the dearest brothers to my heart. I love them passionately. They're my brothers in Jesus Christ. So first last, I'll trust your discernment. If you want to unblock, go ahead. Okay. Guys, let me just make this point about repentance real quickly. You ready? When you say you need to repent, you have people who think that you're saying you have to confess every single sin and stop committing those sins to be saved. You get it? You with me there? So that's why you'll be accused of teaching salvation by works. You with me there? Yeah, of course, Captain. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't make you an admin. But I'm starting to love you more because I, I'm getting to know you. So don't do anything to make you love you less. Okay, so there are people who think that when you say repentance that you're saying 
You need to turn away from every sin, confess every sin, and stop every sin. So they're saying that your teaching works. But by repentance, this is what I mean. And this is what I believe the Bible means. I acknowledge I'm a sinner who's fallen short of the standard of, standard of God. I'm sorry that I've broken his law. I'm convicted that I've broken his law. And I turn to Christ and ask him to forgive me. That's what we mean by repentance, right? Thank you, John Lee. That's what we mean by repentance, right? Those of you talking about repentance, just curious. See, that's a, see, he just proved my point. So are you teaching faith and works, Gusta Tooth? No, it is good enough because that's the biblical understanding. Because then Paul says, you prove your repentance by your deeds. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about once you're saved and born of the Spirit, then you're empowered to do good works to prove that you have saving faith. I'm talking about how are you saved? You're saved by being convicted of your sin and failing God's standard and grieving his heart, being remorseful over it, asking Jesus to forgive you for it, and then trusting in him. Goose tooth. See, now we're splitting hairs. Did you hear the part I said that repentance is that you're convicted at heart because you become remorseful for what you've done. If that's not an inward change, I don't know what it is. Goose, say something else so I can muzzle you. Go ahead. Hold on. See, here's another troublemaker. A know-it-all who thinks he knows it all. Go ahead. Make my day. Make my day, Goose, so I can send you back to the pond. Yes, and I love being arrogant because I decimate clowns like you, Goose. <laughs> Crazy, man. I'm arrogant, and I eat gooses for breakfast, and I send you back to the pond, you ugly goose. <laughs> oh, man. I love it. I love it. We're going to have field days. Was that nice or what? Yeah. This filthy agent of Satan calls me demonic, you little demon. Send him back to Asheron. Exactly. Okay. Okay, folks, let's ask the Lord to bless. Notice I just started. Already we had a few troublemakers I had to bounce, all right? Anyway, <clears throat> praise the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, I ask that you sanctify every one of us. <clears throat> Please sanctify me and help me crucify our flesh, crucify my flesh, wash us in the holy blood of Jesus, and forgive us for all shortcomings and sins we've committed today. Give us the power of your spirit to walk away from sin, to crucify the flesh, and walk in the life of the spirit, the power from the spirit, to be filled with the fruit of the spirit, knowledge and wisdom, understanding from your holy spirit, to live your word perfectly, and to glorify Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. Grant them wisdom, understanding from your spirit to take in the things I say by your spirit. And Father, please protect me from error, stammering, confusion to recall these passages and interpret them perfectly for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. And do not let me be unnecessarily <clears throat> offensive, Father. Loosen my tongue, Father, please, in Jesus' name. And fill my lungs, <clears throat> my throat, my chest with the breath of life, the health I need to glorify you and empower the sound of my voice to the ears of your servants. Bless them, Father. Fill them with your spirit. Cover us. Cover them. Cover myself. Cover our loved ones, my daughters especially, with the holy blood of Jesus and save us from the from the enemy, the evil one, Father. Have your way and be glorified in union with the Son by the power of your spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Some apparently no repent means changing direction, turning from sin. Well, Raymond, when you say turning from sin, what that basically means is you acknowledge, Raymond, let me let me explain. You're acknowledging you've been living a sinful life. You regret living that sinful life. You've been convicted and remorseful for sin against God. So now you turn to Christ and ask God, Christ to forgive you and to save you. That then begins the life in which now the Holy Spirit transforms you to live holy unto the Lord. But that's now the result, the fruit of turning to Christ and asking Christ to save you, right? 
But others understand that when you say repentance, what you're saying is you got to confess every sin and never commit any of those sins before you can get saved, which is not what we mean. Right? You keep calling me Shamwow. Huh? I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. Shamun Wow, like you're amazing, or Shamwow. Right? Now, help me to help you, folks. Help me to help you. When someone is teaching, what I normally do is I sit and listen, right? And I don't try to pontificate and chime in because it's not my time to teach. So please, guys, if you want to get the most of these sessions and be blessed, pray for me to be filled with the Spirit to bless you so I can be a blessing to you. Do not get into side discussions not relevant to the topic. Keep your questions related to the topic and do read the passages or at least hear the passages because I want you to learn and benefit for the glory of Christ. Thank you, Stevenson, Dennis, Sham, wow it is. And do hit the like button. Now, before I begin our discussion, I was asked about Revelation 1.8 and the angels. Th did Satan take a third of the angels with him? I want to answer those two qu real quickly, right? Amen, Raymond G Gator. You got it. <clears throat> before I answer that, I just want to ask a question. Do you guys remember that session I did? It was on Friday, I believe. Right before Anthony Rogers' debate with that Unitarian heretic, was that Friday? When we discussed the communion of saints and I went in depth on 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And I said, do not misuse, misinterpret the scripture because you have anti-Trinitarians who misuse 1 Timothy 2, 5 to also prove that Jesus can't be God. And then I said, I'm willing to bet any one of you who's willing to bet me that in tonight's debate, which was Friday, that heretic is going to use 1 Timothy 2.5 to prove that just because Jesus is distinguished from the one God, he cannot be God. And bam, what did he use? What did he use? Do you guys remember? I even prophesied it. So that tells you I'm a true prophet. Do you remember that? I said it. And why did I say it? I said it in the context of, Trinitarians who love the triune God would never allow an anti-Trinitarian to misuse 1 Timothy 2.5 to deny the deity of Christ. And yet we use it to disprove the fact that there can be others who are born of the Spirit, one with Christ, forming his spiritual body, who can share in his mediation. Do you remember that? I said that. I go, just like you wouldn't allow an anti-Trinitarian to misuse that. Just because Jesus is distinguished from the one God doesn't mean that he's not one with the one God in essence. In a similar fashion, just because Christ is the one mediator doesn't mean he doesn't allow the members of his spiritual body, the church, to participate in his mediation to the Father for the salvation of others. You caught it? Was that clear? That's not really related to tonight's topic. Daniel Roach, free will and all that. In the future, I'll try to talk about it. The topic will be Jesus in Psalm 110 and anything related to the deity of Jesus Christ. Because Psalm 110 is one of the passages that the New Testament quotes most frequently to affirm Jesus' exaltation to the status, glory, and honor of God. So let's keep it relevant to the deity of Christ, Psalm 110, as a witness to the deity of Christ. And I'll take anything related to those two points. That's why Revelation 1.8, I think, is relevant. But there was a question asked of me yesterday, and it's not directly related to the topic, so I may break my rules. Because we had Choose Jesus asking me about Satan taking a third of the angels with him. Group on Roblox? What's Roblox? I don't know what it is. I have no idea. Yeah. Guys. Do you really want to learn and be biblicist? Remember I said, I don't want to be a Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox. I want to be a biblicist. I want to affirm all that the Bible teaches. And my prayer is the Holy Spirit will allow me to see what the Bible teaches and accept all of its teachings, even if it means I have to abandon some traditions that I, were, I was taught were biblical. So do you guys want to be biblicists? You guys want to be biblicists? Trust the Holy Spirit to fill me, to bless you for the glory of Jesus. Holy Spirit, fill us and fall upon us for the glory of Christ. All right. Here's what you've been told. Here's what you've been told. You've been told Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, and Ezekiel 28, 11, 19, talk about 
the fall of Satan. You've been further told than Revelation 12. <clears throat> Revelation 12, starting at verse 3 all the way to 9, Satan took a third of the angels with him in his rebellion against God. Right? That's what you've been told, right? Lord Jesus willing, if God gives me the health and the holiness to delight his heart and provides for my needs and saves me from my trial, I will teach in all these topics, but it's going to take time. You can't rush me. I can't talk about too many topics, especially when I got a lot of trials going around me, right? But now, pray me out of those trials so I can focus. For now, I'm going to tell you, Isaiah 14, if you read the context, verses 3 to 23. Ezekiel 28, if you read the context, starting at verse 1 and read to 19, neither of those passages ever reference Satan explicitly directly. That is an assumption it's about Satan. If you just let the passages speak, it's talking about the kings of Babylon and the kings, king of Babylon, king of Tyre, respectively, who in their arrogance thought they were gods, divine beings that could rival God, and God is going to cut them down to size and kill them like the mere human maggots that they are. I will go in depth in demonstrating that the plain reading of the passages do not speak of Satan. So there's nothing explicit about Satan's origin or fall in those passages. So I can't do it now, but I'm challenging you to go and read those passages more deeply. Okay. So now I'm going to answer another one. Defending Christianity is solid. So I don't know why you'd block him anyway. I don't know why he's solid. Did he say something rude? I don't think he meant it. Now, let me show you the passage that's quoted to show that Satan took a third of the angels with him. See, I knew Daniel Roach was going to quote it. Daniel, why are you debating me, friend? That doesn't prove your point. It refutes you. See? Oh, you're an anointed cherub. Come on, man. You can't have your cake and eat it too. If Satan was a cherub, according to Book of Revelation, a cherub is one of the four living creatures, and they're distinguished from angels. So is he an angel that fell or he's a cherub? You can't have your cake and eat it too. That's why I said, don't ask me, explain it, because I'm going to refute your misinterpretation of it in a future session. And this is another thing that kills me. People think I haven't studied these passages you know, carefully to know that there in Ezekiel 10, the king of Tyre is said to be anointed cherub. And the garden of God is not eaten, really? Do you know what the word garden is in, in the Hebrew? It The word garden of God and the word garden in the Hebrew context is a reference back to the garden of Eden because that is the garden of God, right? That's a pathetic argument, St. Dennis. You know my refutation of it. But before you guys challenge me on Ezekiel 28, because I, I don't want you to tempt me to correct your misinterpretations of it. I told you, if you study it, no, Daniel Roach, you're mistaken. The Jewish tradition identify the cherubim as the guardians of the throne. Quote me one source that says that they are choirs. And the seraphim are the cherubim, Daniel Roach. I'm about to block you. But before I do, let me correct your perversion of scripture, Daniel Roach. The seraphim are the cherubim according to Revelation 4 and 5. So right there you got busted by going to tradition. Okay? Let me repeat it again. Isaiah 6 gives you a depiction of the seraphim. Ezekiel 10 gives you a depiction of the cherubim. Go and read Revelation 4 and 5. The four living creatures are depicted in the same way the seraphim are depicted in Isaiah 6 and the cherubim are depicted in Ezekiel 10, showing you the seraphim and cherubim are the same class of creatures, two names for the same class of beings. You just got destroyed and you refuted yourself by saying, cherubim, choir of angels below seraphim. You see what happens when you start parroting human tradition? Stop pontificating. You're going to embarrass yourself, brother. See, I'm being nice to you, but you want to challenge me. You're going to lose. Trust me when I say this. We need more bold fire brimstone preachers will be in your face. And I, oh, I'm sorry. Did I offend you? You want one of those? Go find them. But let me send this guy in his merry way. See, too many chiefs who think they know scripture and they don't. You're one of them, Daniel Roach. Let me call a spade a spade. Yeah. 
Sam Price, if you ever say there's a possibility it applies to David and, uh, and Jesus, Sam, Sam Price, explain to me why I shouldn't bounce you for that. That applies to David and Jesus. Because you just turned Jesus' argument upside down on its head. If it's about David, then Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. Why are you parroting uninspired, fallible scholarship that tells you it may about David, but then apply to Jesus? When Jesus presupposes it's not about David, but David is speaking about him, the Messiah. Why do you parrot what you hear from scholars, opinions of scholars who make mincemeat out of Jesus' words and turn his argument upside down and then rob his argument of the force, of the weight behind the logic he employed to show that since David spoke of the Messiah as his Lord, he had to be more than his son. No, it didn't sound like you're asking a question. Okay. I'm going to go on my, one of my rants. I guess you guys are going to tire of me. Are you guys sure? You guys still want me to be teaching, knowing how I can be very stern? You guys okay with it? You okay with me being a stern teacher and keep teaching? Because I'm here to serve you. If you don't want me to teach, hey, God doesn't need me. Okay. Let me tell you what not to do. It is a sad state of affairs. Nadim, do I give a damn that you think I'm arrogant? I'll be more arrogant in your face. You don't like it? Cry me a river. Here, let's sing Nadim a, a song. Cry me a river. You're arrogant to think I care about your opinion. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the regulars that come here. They don't want me to teach. That's okay. Nadim, cry me a river. Hey, did you like that? Cry me a river. Anyway. Man, you, I can throw down. Anyway, okay. We live in a sad state of affairs because conservative evangelical scholars. No, 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 Sam Price, it's okay. I want to comment to explain. Conservative evangelical scholars, don't take my word for it, will tell you that Psalm 110 was either written about David or about some king either before the exile or after exile, and these are evangelical Christians, shame on them, shame on them for taking that position to appease liberal, unbelieving scholarship, because that's what it is, a capitulation to liberal, unbelieving scholarship. Hey, don't talk about your mother like this. Don't call us your mother pet, pet's names, Tacky. Okay? Your mother doesn't appreciate you calling her out in public like that. Yeah, block this guy. Okay. If it was written about David or it was written about some king before or after the exile, that means you destroy Jesus' argument. Listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus' argument, Mark 12, 35 to 37, Jesus' argument is that since David, follow with me, folks. Since David wrote Psalm 110 about the Messiah, where he calls the Messiah his Lord, the Messiah can't be just his son. He has to be more than his son because if all the Messiah was was a human son of David, then David would not call him Lord. But if you're telling me it's written about David, then that means David didn't write it about the Messiah. Or if you're telling me it was written about some king long after David, before the exile, after exile, that means, again, Jesus' argument is wrong. You just put a weapon in the hands, in the hands of the enemies of the gospel, like that dog, Tovia Singer, that son of Satan, to show that, see, Jesus didn't know what he's talking about because it's, David didn't write it about the Messiah. It was either written about David, or if David did write it, it was in reference to Solomon, or it was written about some other king after David, either before the exile to Babylon or after their return. Did you get it? You understand how dangerous, how destructive this scholarship is? To adopt a view of Psalm 110. No, Karma is a sister in the Lord. Guys, come on, you're trigger happy. You're trigger happy. Karma is a sister in the Lord. To adopt a position concerning the authorship of Psalm 110 
that goes against Jesus to make Jesus look bad and to make his apostles look bad. You with me there? This is why you see I react and get angry when someone says, oh, it may be about David. You see why I reacted, Sam Price? Because if it's about David, then you destroy Jesus' argument. You guys don't understand what you're doing? Jesus said it's about Messiah, and David wrote it by the Holy Spirit. Here, let me show you. Let's settle it. Mark 12, 35 to 37. So it's part of the topic. Guys, let's not get into debate about Bible virgins, please. Dovey Singer is pathetic. He's a vile dog like these other Mohammedan polemicists. They serve the same master. Right? Here, so Mark 12, 35, 37. Guys, read with me. Mark 12, read with me. Mark 12, 35, 37. Jesus. And Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, David wrote these words as the Holy Spirit revealed it to him and taught it to him. The Lord said to my Lord, sit down on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Verse 37, David therefore himself calleth him Lord. David calls Messiah Christ Lord. And whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Folks, Jesus said the Holy Spirit made it known to David, revealed to David, that Messiah the Christ is his Lord who sits at God's right hand, and then David wrote about it. But if you're telling me David wrote about, it, about Solomon, Jesus didn't know what he's talking about. If you're telling me it was written about David, Jesus didn't know what he's talking about. If you're telling me it's written about some king after David, either before the Jews went into captivity or when they returned, Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. And you destroyed his argument. You with me there? You get it? So if you believe Mark is accurate and inspired and he gives you the words of the historical Jesus, and if you believe the historical Jesus said, David wrote Psalm 110 about the Christ, and Jesus is the Christ, as the Holy Spirit revealed it to him, any commentary that tells you, any commentary that tells you that David wrote about Solomon or is written about David or may have been written about a king after David died, either before the Jews went into captivity or returned, spit on that commentary. Spit on the commentary. It's worse than the Quran. You with me there? Sorry being passionate in your face. How can you say you're an evangelical Christian who loves Jesus and take a position other than the position taken by Christ in order to make Jesus look bad and put a weapon in the hands of the enemies like Tovia Singer, that dog of Satan, to make Jesus look like a false messiah who didn't know what he's talking about? Honestly. You see the state of scholarship today? That's why I tell people, the worst thing you can do to go to college and seminary, because it's cemetery, you'll go in alive and come out dead. No passion, no fire. Yeah, we reached out to him, Michael Brown and I, to do a series of debates, but he's too afraid to face Michael Brown, so he doesn't want to do it. And I said, no, you debate Brown and you debate me. Three debates, one with Brown, two with me. And he, he fears Michael Brown. Michael Brown is his nightmare. Okay, do you see why I get angry? You see why I get angry when someone tells me it may have been written about David or David may have written it about <clears throat> Solomon? Hold on, I guess we got more troublemakers. You with me there? You can't take a position other than the position Jesus took, right? Sorry about that. So I'm getting everyone upset because they didn't like my talk on baptism. 
Destination wants to try to pontificate in the comment section. See, I can't stand people that do that. Anyway. Anyway, with that said, with that said, let's take it step by step. Jesus affirmed David was speaking about the Messiah. Peter agrees. Let's go to Acts 2. Let's go to Acts 2, 33 to 35. Acts 2, 33 to 35. And then now you're going to see why Jesus' words are so important. Acts 2, 33, 35, because I'm going to show you what the Lord Jesus warned the disciples about. When he was talking about the Pharisees and the scribes, the teachers of the law, Acts 2, 33 to 35, Protestant. You're dropping the ball, man. You used to be good. I don't know what happened to you. I don't know why I included 36 or 37. What happened to you, Protestant? Bro, what happened, man? Are you protesting again? Last time I checked, 36, 37 doesn't look like 33 to 35. Acts 2, 33, 35. Show me it on. Okay. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. And for David, pay attention here, Peter, for David is not ascended into heaven. But he saith himself, the Lord said unto my, my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So notice, this is Pentecost. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. And the Spirit moves Peter to quote Psalm 1101 and say, David didn't go to heaven, but he wrote about the Messiah, that God exalted him to his right hand in heaven. Was Peter right? Was Peter right? Good love life. Watch it. You're going to love it. Was Jesus right when he said, David by the Holy Spirit spoke of the Messiah in Psalm 110? So both Jesus and Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said David wrote Psalm 110 by the Holy Spirit about Christ, not about someone else. So then when an evangelical Christian tells you, it may have been written about David, or David may have been writing about Solomon or some other king long after David, then you got problems because you're claiming to be an evangelical devoted to the authority of scripture. This is why Jesus' words are beautiful in Matthew 23, 8 to 10. In Matthew 23, 8 to 10, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, and he warns the disciples. Notice his warning, folks. Matthew 23, 8 to 10. Let me unpack this so you can learn. And I hope you're learning. I hope you're still being blessed. I hope the Holy Spirit is just moving you in your spirit. And I pray he's filling me for the glory of Christ. Matthew 23, 8 to 10. Watch here. Medic, we just quoted it. Acts 2, 33 to 36. We read to 35. But Medic, it's Acts 2, 33 to 36. Peter, that was Peter. On Pentecost. Now read Matthew 23, 8 to 10. Read with me. Jesus speaking to the disciples. But be not ye called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters or teachers. For one is your master, even Christ. Now, let me tell you what Jesus did not mean. Are you ready? Because this is also misquoted. Jesus is not saying you can't use the title father for someone. Nor is he saying you can't call someone teacher. How do I know? Because all throughout the New Testament, you find people called our fathers by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You with me there? For example, Romans 4.16, Paul says, Abraham, our father. Romans 4.16, Abraham, our father. And 1 Corinthians 4.15, Paul says he became... The Corinthians' father, right? So it's not saying you can't use the title and call someone your father. Of course, that's my point, choose Jesus. If he means don't call any man on earth your father, then that means Paul is contradicting Jesus, and Jesus is contradicting law, God forbid, because Paul in Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3, Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3, Mentions one of the Ten Commandments where it says, Honor your father and mother, 
so that you may live long in the land that the Lord God will give you. And he says, this is the first command with promise. So what Jesus is not saying is you can't call someone teacher. You can't call someone rabbi. You can't call someone father. You with me there? So what does he mean? You want to know what he means? See, reading something is not enough. You have to understand his words. What does he mean? You, you want to know what he means? What he means is you are not to look to any teacher, any authority figure as being infallible where you accept every word, every pronouncement that comes out of his mouth. Jesus is saying you do not give any human authority undivided, perfect allegiance and obedience. Exactly. Like the Pope. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to be honest. I'm not trying to insult anyone. Are you with me there? That's what he means. And how do I know that's the meaning? Because of the context. Because of the context. What's the context? Look at Israel's religious guides. They don't practice what they preach. They preach law of Moses. And as long as they preach law of Moses, hear the law of Moses, but they don't do. They are hypocrites and they stop people from entering the kingdom who blindly follow them. You with me there? Are you guys listening? Am I getting your attention? How do I know that's Jesus' words? The chapter, the context. He's talking about spiritual guides, religious authorities. And he says, they don't practice what they preach. They talk about the law of Moses and burden people with all their traditions, but they don't lift a finger you know, to, to help anyone. They don't carry their own burdens that they put on people. They're hypocrites, blind guides, and people follow them blindly to hell. I don't want you to be like that, and I don't want you to look to any human authority in that manner. In other words, what Jesus is saying, right? What Jesus is saying, can you block this guy, Tubbs, this agent of Satan? What Jesus is saying is, not so much don't use the word father. What he's saying is, do not look to any human authority especially in spiritual matters, as an infallible guide that you give your wholehearted, undivided devotion and allegiance to. No man, no man is to be honored in that way. No man is to be followed to that extent. No man is to be obeyed to that extent. We call those figures cult leaders. You with me there? Satan's really getting angry today. All his children are out but we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not even me. I'm not saying you do, but some people love me more than I deserve and look to me as a guide. I am imperfect, and you see it. I get angry. I'll, I'll ch cuss you out, yell at you, block you, call you dog, bow, wow, wow, right? My point is what Jesus is saying. If he's human, he's fallible, do not, Give him your wholehearted, undivided allegiance, attention, devotion, obedience. The only one that you wholeheartedly obey and never question and give your complete obedience and allegiance to is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's it. Guys, how come you haven't blocked no to spider? I thought you guys were going to be doing that. You with me there? That's what Jesus means. Your father in heaven, never question anything that comes from him. Obey everything that comes out of his mouth. Give him your complete allegiance, obedience, and perfect love, even unto death. Me, Jesus, you give me the same exact allegiance and devotion you give to the father. Only look to the father and I, as well as the spirit, and give us your wholehearted, undivided trust, allegiance, obedience, and love. No one else. No one else. Not your pastor. Not your apologist. Especially me. Believe me, especially me. Right? Not David Wood, Anthony Rogers, James White, John P Piper, John MacArthur, Daniel Wallace, Mike Lacuna. We're all fallible, uninspired. We're all tainted. We all struggle with sin. We're all being tempted by Satan to compromise and cave in. We're all going to fail you. 
and we don't have perfect understanding of scripture, the triune God and only the triune God, God alone, we look to with undivided allegiance, love, devotion, and trust, and never question anything that comes from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You with me there? That's what Matthew 23, 8 to 10 says. That's why when someone tells me what such and such scholar says, Psalm 110, well, you tell such and such scholar, I'm going to use this commentary for toilet paper if he contradicts Jesus. Or the Spirit-filled apostles when they were speaking the words of the Holy Spirit. Teddy, your mother doesn't exist and your father doesn't exist. You're in the matrix. You're actually a dog. That thinks that, you know, you're human. Don't just, ban, uh, you know, Muslim, ban him. So is that clear? Yeah, but John Piper said, whom last time I checked, John Piper is not an apostle. He is in Jesus. He's not God the Father. And, oh, but wait. David Wood said, Christian Prince said, Sam Shamoon said, Last time I checked, none of us are inspired like the apostles were, receiving revelations like they did, and we're not Jesus in the flesh, and we're not God the Father. So what? You with me there? I hope you're still benefiting, benefiting from this discussion. You with me there? I want you to learn the current state of scholarship among professing evangelicals has become dangerous. I'm not lying to you. I went to the Evangelical Theological Society last November. It was in Denver. And they have all these major Christian publishers. Pay attention to this, folks. And they have all their books out. So I went to all the major Christian publishing companies, publishers that produce Bible commentaries. And I went and looked at Psalm 110 and all the major commentaries. You know what I found? These are evangelical Christians, folks, who say they believe in the Trinity, and I'm not saying they don't, and believe the Bible is inspired, inerrant, and infallible. Do you know what I found in the commentaries by evangelicals? Do you know what I found? These are evangelicals who say they believe in inspiration, inerrancy. When I went to Psalm 110, the commentaries were saying that this psalm may have been written before the exile or after the exile about a king. Some even suggested it may have been written about David or David wrote about Solomon. These are evangelical scholars taking a position that destroys the very force of Jesus's interpretation of Psalm 110. Charles Dickens, they're not liberal. They claim to be conservative, but they sound worse than the liberals. What's true, Sam, uh, Mickey? It's true that it's about David. Then you just said Jesus is wrong and Peter's, Peter's wrong. Do you see why Jesus' words are timely? Oh, that's what you're saying? Well, I can't say whether they're believers or not. If they're believers, they're compromised. And are being used of Satan without realizing it. Let me repeat it again. If they're believers, they are compromised and being used by Satan without realizing it. And they will be rebuked by the Lord Jesus. Right? But don't forget, we are warned in scriptures. Satan's children will masquerade as ministers of righteousness, wolves in sheep's clothing. So they're going to look like Christians, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. That's what Paul said. Right? But could can there be a true believer who is so compromised with the world that he wants the respect of the world, so he's going to sound like the world in order to get respect? Unfortunately, yes. But if they're true believers, they're going to be chastened, disciplined, rebuked by the Lord. Right? Is that clear? So this is still related to Psalm 110. This is why you see I'm very quick to get angry when I hear a Christian saying it may be about David. This is why I was even upset with my dear brother, Michael Brown, whom I love. In the last two debates on the Messiahship of Jesus, 
he conceded the point that Psalm 110 may be a psalm written by a court poet about David, but then applied to Jesus. Do you know that's what he said? Go back and check the last two debates he had with a Jew on the Messiahship of Jesus, on Jesus being the Messiah of Israel. He said in those debates that Psalm 110 either is a psalm written by a court poet about David applied to Jesus, or it's about the Messiah. He goes, I'm okay with either interpretation. You know that? It hurt me that he would say that. And he's a brother in the Lord who loves the Lord. I understand his strategy. He didn't want to get into a side issue of whether David wrote it. Because his time is limited. And he doesn't want to get into an issue that's irrelevant to the bigger point that Jesus is the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. But still in saying that, someone like Tobias Singer can say, even Michael Brown concedes that it may be a court poet writing out about David. Right? You see my problem with scholarship. Folks, again, I'm going to sound like a broken record. Your ultimate authority is to the Trinity and to the Bible. Not me, no one else. I may be wrong, and you may point out I'm wrong, but in my arrogance, in my arrogance, right, and pride, I may not see it nor want to see it and want to tear you to shreds that you don't agree with me. Who cares? May God have mercy and convict me to see my error and to repent. As long as you are fully committed to the triune God and the Bible and an accurate interpretation of the Bible, God will bless you and exalt you. I agree, Billy Mandalay. This is why I tell Christians, if you want to be apologists or you want to be Bible teachers learning your faith, please, I know I'm going to upset a lot of professors, don't go to college or seminary. You'll go in alive, you'll come out dead because you'll be confused. No more passion or boldness to say, thus saith the Lord, because you're going to be confused. Did God really say this? Did David really write this? You come out dead. Instead, go to college and get you, get you some secular education to fall on, to provide for yourself, right? And then study the resources that God has made available for free. Study David Wood's articles, his, his YouTube videos, Christian prints. Study my articles, my videos, Anthony Rogers, you know, Ed, Edward Dalcor. And when it comes to issues like the Trinity, James White. When it comes to refuting rabbinic Jewish objections against Jesus, Michael Brown's multi-volume work, study these sources for free and ask the Holy Spirit who loves you more than you can imagine, who's almighty, who is with you to preserve you perfectly. Holy Spirit, you are my God. I trust in you to protect me. Please guide me to all truth and save me from error. How are you doing, idiot? Right? That's the best way to learn. And I promise you, the stuff we provide are battle-tested arguments that we use in the apologetic arena that work, that have been tested and refined by the grace of the Spirit that cannot be refuted. S sometimes the stuff you learn in seminary, you'll never use in your debates or in your evangelism or in your witness. Yes, he is. Is that clear? Is that clear? Okay. So that was my 20 plus minute rant on Psalm 110. It's still relevant to Psalm 110. It's still relevant to Psalm 110 because it shows you Jesus' view of Psalm 110. Now, here's an objection that I'm going to refute. Are you ready now? This comes from one of my articles. Let me get the uh, link. Here. I'm going to post this in the description box after the video. Here it is. I want you to click on that. Now, when you look at the ascription of the psalm, it says, a psalm of David. La Dawid Mizmur. La Dawid Mizmur. And this is to answer one of the objections. Someone asked me to answer this objection. Some of the rabbinic Jews will tell you, La Dawid Mazmur doesn't mean a psalm of David because it can mean 
a psalm about David or to David, right? Some will argue the, the phrase La Dawid doesn't mean necessarily a psalm of David. It can mean a psalm to David or about David. Are you with me there? I want to refute this objection. Are you ready for me to refute this to show you no? Every time the phrase La Dawid appears above the psalm, let me repeat, this is in that article. Every time the phrase La Dawid appears in the psalms, there's nothing in the context. Please hear me out, folks. I need your attention here because I'm going to help you make the best case possible for the glory of the Chime God by the power of the Holy Spirit. That phrase, La Dawid, every time it's used in the Psalms, there's nothing in the context to show it doesn't mean a Psalm written by David. Nothing. And I give the list. It's in the article. I give the list. It's There's too many for me to post. Let me see if it'll, it'll show up. Let me see. But it's in the article. Click on it and go there. Click on it and go there. See, it won't let me because it exceeds the 200 words. Okay. Anyway, you go there, and I give you the list in which the phrase La Dawid appears, or La Dawid Mazmur, or Mazmur La Dawid. Every time it appears, there's nothing in the context to show it doesn't mean a psalm that David wrote. A psalm that David wrote. Are you with me? But anyway, save the link then. That's fine. Are you with me there? The only psalm that is questioned whether the phrase La Dawid means a psalm of David is Psalm 110. Co coincidence? Is that a coincidence? If you show a rabbinic Jew or a scholar every place where the phrase La Dawid is used, specifically a rabbinic Jew, right? I will be shocked if he or she would deny it means David wrote it. But all of a sudden, for Psalm 110, when that phrase La Dawid appears, it no longer means a psalm that David wrote, but a psalm about David or to David. Is that convenient? Is that a coincidence? That of all the psalms, no one would argue that when the phrase La Dawid appears before the psalm, that means David wrote it. But for some reason, Psalm 110, oh, it doesn't necessarily mean that anymore. Coincidence? Or do you see a diabolical <clears throat> plot here to try to rob this psalm of its messianic import? Right? You get my point? So that's my point for those of you. If a rabbinic Jew tells you, La Dawi doesn't mean Psalm David wrote, it can be a psalm about David to David, show him all the places where that phrase is used and say, can you show me in any of these other psalms where that phrase, La Dawid, is used? In the context, it doesn't point to David being the author. Any other place, would you deny David wrote it? If they're going to be honest, they'll say no. Then why is it, why is it that when it comes to Psalm 110, all of a sudden, La Dawid doesn't mean a psalm written by David? Why is that? I'm not even fluent in English to be fluent in Hebrew or Greek. Right? Is that clear? And I gave you all the references. So save the article and study it. Oops, let me get the link again. Enough to get me in trouble. How much Aramaic I know? Enough to get me in trouble. Okay, now a second objection. Second objection. They'll tell you, yeah, it is written by David. Okay, are you guys ready to go into the meat of the psalm? Satapudi, stop asking me the same question that I answered in the comment section and stop bombarding my comment section with the same, same question that I've answered. Please, please, brother. There is no secret rapture, but that's not the topic. Okay, now the second objection and I'm going to shut this down. And here's my other article. Here's the other article I wrote to refute this assertion. The second objection is, yeah, David wrote it, but he wrote it about Solomon. Okay? 
Here is the other article where I refute this nonsense. David wrote it, but he wrote it about Solomon. Now, are you ready for me to refute that? Good, Sam Price. Sam Price and everyone else, please, save the links to the articles, study the arguments, use them. You won't be refuted by the power of the Holy Spirit, I promise you, if you study the arguments and use them. Okay? Now, let's refute the assertion that it's about Solomon. Let's refute the assertion it's about Solomon. Let me get rid of this guy. Hold on. Another agent I'm saying. It's unbelievable, man, these guys. Hold on. Number one, according to the scriptures, pay attention to this. According to the scriptures, Solomon could never be David's Lord. Are you ready now for the refutation? Solomon could never be David's Lord. You know why? Because as, far, as long as David was alive, Solomon was subject to David. <clears throat> and at no point in time was he Lord over David. And if you don't believe me, simply read 1 Kings chapters 1 and 2. 1 Kings chapters 1 and 2. Read, and I give you proof from 1 Kings chapter 1 and 2, that as long as David was alive, Solomon was subject to David, subordinate to David, obedient to David, and David told him what to do. Right? As long as David was alive. At no point in time did David ever call Solomon his Lord, recognize Solomon as Lord, and at no point in time did Solomon claim to be Lord over his father David. As long as David was alive, as long as David was alive, Solomon was subject to David, subordinate to David, David, obedient to David. And that's all in my article. It's all in my article, right? The second point, the second point. The Bible is quite clear that Solomon and all the sons of David sat on the throne of David. It was David's throne they inherited. So let me make this point clear. The Bible teaches the throne in Israel was God's throne that he gave to David. That's why it's called the throne of David. Nowhere will you find the throne of God on earth called the throne of Solomon in the sense that it was the throne given to Solomon and Solomon's heirs. You find the opposite. It's the throne given to David. It's his, which his heirs inherit from him and sit on in his place. Am I being clear here or am I confusing you? I'm going to read just from Solomon himself. Okay? Solomon himself. Okay, let me repeat it again. God has two thrones. Had two thrones, I should say. God had two thrones. One in heaven that he occupied and one on earth in Jerusalem that he gave to David as a gift of his grace. That's why in the Bible, we are repeatedly told it's the throne of David that his sons sit upon on behalf of David in the place of David ruling <clears throat> on his behalf. So the throne in heaven, God occupies. The throne on earth was given to David as his inheritance and all the sons of David sat on his throne in his place representing him. Is that clear? Is that clear? How you doing, Andrew? Hope you didn't miss too much, but you can go back and listen to it from the beginning. Yes. Now, let me show you that. I'm going to read this, and then I'll have Protestant believer quote the rest. This is in my article. Let me read 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. It's I'm going to read it. It's long. Do you guys mind me reading lengthy quotations from my article? Can I go ahead and read? Because you're here to learn and hear the Bible, right? Me, read the Bible, explain it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is all in my article. I'm going to read. Solomon, okay? Here we go. Let me read. Start. Just follow with me. Admins, moderators, keep an eye as I read. Now watch. 1 Kings 2, verses 1 to 12. Now it was coming close to the day of David's de death, and he gave his son Solomon a charge 
saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself to be a man and keep the charge of the Lord, Yehovah, your God, walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that Yehovah, the Lord, may carry out his word that he spoke concerning me. Watch. Here's what God promised me, Solomon. If your children take heed to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their hearts and with all their souls, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. You see, if they keep covenant with me, my promise to you, David, you won't fail to have a man from your line sitting on the throne. Did you catch it? Now, let me read the last portion for the sake of time. So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Watch. David reigned over Israel 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Sol Solomon sat upon the throne of his father, David, and his kingdom. Bam. End of story. Let me now quote that part. Last verse, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. But I'm going to quote the last part. Solomon sat upon the throne of his father, David. Whose throne? His father's throne and his father's kingdom. If it's David's throne that Solomon is inheriting, David's kingdom that Solomon's inheriting, how can Solomon ever be greater than David? Solomon himself says the same thing. First Kings chapter 2, the same chapter. I'm going to read verses 23 to 24. 1 Kings 2, 23 to 24, verse 33, and verses 44 to 45. 44, 45, all of my article. Pay attention, follow with me. Okay? Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, Yahovah, saying, May God do so to me, and more also, if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. Now, therefore, as Yahovah lives, who has established me and set me on the throne of David my father. Whose throne? Solomon's throne? No, I'm sitting on my father's throne. I'm sitting on my father's throne. Okay. And who has made me a house as he promised Adonijah shall be put to death this day. Therefore, their blood shall return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his seed forever. But upon David and upon his seed and upon his house and upon his throne. It's David's seed. David's house, David's throne, shall the peace of the Lord rest forever. Is it making sense? Is this blessing you? Are you learning? Or am I putting you guys to sleep? Okay, let me continue. Okay. The king also said to Shammai, you know all the wickedness in your heart and what you did to David, my father. This is Solomon speaking. Therefore, Yahovah, the Lord, shall return your wickedness on your own head, but King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before Yehovah forever. Wow. Let me post it. Are you learning? I'm showing you how to decimate the anti-Christian rabbi's objection against this being about a divine Messiah. Okay? Did you see Solomon himself says, it's my father's throne, and I'm sitting on my father's throne, and 1 Kings 2 says, it's David's seed, David's house, David's kingdom, David's throne. Okay. Again, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 6 to 7. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 6 to 7. Solomon again. Solomon answered, you have shown great mercy to your servant David. He's praying to God. My father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and uprightness of heart toward you. And you have shown him great kindness in giving him a son to sit on his throne. This is Solomon talking to God. Lord God, you've loved my father so much. You gave him a son to sit on his throne. I'm that son. It's his throne because you love him. Now, O oh Lord, Yehovah, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. Do I need to go on? Let me read another one. 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 2 to 5. 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 2 to 5. I'm going to read the last part. Solomon again, right, says, But now, Lord, Yehovah, my God, has given me peace on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor misfortune. 
So know that I plan to build a house to honor the name of Yahovah, Yahovah, my God, just as Yahovah spoke to my, to my father saying, your son, meaning Solomon, whom I will set on your throne after you. Man. Is it sinking in, folks, or you're not getting it? Are you getting it? Do you see, according to the Bible, Solomon at no point in time was Lord over David. As long as David was alive, David was Lord over Solomon. Solomon was subject to David, subordinate to him, obedient to him. And when David died, it's David's throne that Solomon sits upon. David's kingdom that Solomon rules. David's house that Solomon maintains. So how can David call Solomon his Lord? Which is exactly Jesus' point, by the way. Jesus' point is, if the Messiah is a mere human son of David, he could never be David's Lord. Because if he's just a man... He'll always be subject to David. It'll always be David's throne that he sits upon on behalf of David. You get it now? You see how powerful Jesus' arguments happen to be, if you understand the Old Testament, contrary to these evangelical conservatives who would take a position other than Jesus to make mincemeat out of our Lord's words to their shame and humiliation? Right? Psalm 132, 11, 8, 18. There's a lot of Psalms. Psalm 89 is another one. We'll look at that in a minute. But I'm going to read these for now, Protestant, because it's in my article. Psalm 132, 11, 18. Guys, pay attention. Psalm 132, 11, 18. Yahovah has sworn with a sure oath to David that he will not turn from it. From the fruit of your body will I set a son on your throne. God is saying to David, it's your throne. If your children will keep my covenant and my testimonies that I sh shall teach them, then their children shall also sit upon your throne. See, your sons, Solomon, Hezekiah, it's not their throne. It's your throne, David. They will sit on your throne. Let me let me post it. For Forever, for the Lord has chosen Zion. Do I need to quote more verses to make my point, or did you get the point? Do you see it? Psalm 132. Saul in my article, study the article, verses 11, 18. Even the prophecy of the Messiah to come, right? It says that the Messiah is sitting on the throne of David. Here, I'll have Protestant believer post it. Protestant believer, post Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Exactly, TAC maps. And what's unreal, it's conservative evangelical scholars that are putting a weapon in the hands of the enemies of Christ. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Brother, make a good point. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born. This is about Jesus the Messiah. Unto us the son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Notice, and Prince of Peace, notice verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David, and upon David's kingdom, to order it and establish it. Wow. Messiah, who's God in the flesh, is going to sit on David's throne, ruling David's kingdom. Could it be any clearer that God's earthly throne is David's? God's earthly kingdom belongs to David. And the sons who sit on that throne are sitting on the throne on behalf of David in his place representing him, which means at no point in time can he, any of those sons be greater than David. Is it making sense now? At no point in time. Luke 1, 32 to 33. Luke 1, 32 to 33. And for Andrew, I'm making a case that Psalm 110 is written by David about a divine Messiah, not a mere human son of his. That's what I'm arguing for, Andrew. And you can go back and listen at the beginning and then read the articles to show that Jesus knew what he's talking about. 
Yes, Luke, it is. Now, Luke 1, 32, 33, read with me. Luke 1, 32, 33, read with, read with me. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. This is talking about Jesus. Gabriel's telling Mary, you're going to conceive by the Holy Spirit as a virgin and give birth to a son. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Man, does it get any clearer whose throne it is? Even in reference to Jesus, Mary's being told, your son is going to sit on the throne of his father, David. Can it be any clearer? If anyone's confused, let me know if you are. If it's making sense, let me know by putting a one. If you got it, put a one. If you're confused, put a two. So what's the point if you got it? Since it's David's throne, David's kingdom, David's household, his sons are simply sitting on his throne as his representatives in his place, as his heir. As such, they can never be his Lord because it's his throne that they're inheriting. And as long as it's his throne, he'll always be greater than them, not simply because he's their biological father or ancestor, but because it's his throne that they sit on, on his behalf in his place. You with me there? Let's go to 1 Chronicles 29, 23. 1 Chronicles 29, 23, Protestant believer. You got it, medic. God bless you, brother. You got it. How can someone tell you that in Psalm 110, David is writing about Solomon, when Solomon is subordinate to David, subject to David, obedient to David, and at no point in time was he ever David's Lord? You got it. He doesn't need to because the Lord rebuked him and chastened him. First Chronicles 29, 23. Read with me. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David, his father. In other words, what it's saying is he sat on the throne on behalf of David in the place of David representing David. Did you catch it? So notice it's Jehovah's throne that he gave to David on earth that Solomon is occupying. Did you catch it? Jehovah's throne that he gave to David on earth, which Solomon then occupies on behalf of David, right? Second Chronicles 13, verse 8. Second Chronicles 13, verse 8. Now, we had a good record today, 144. Hopefully, we'll get to 1,000 soon, God willing. And now you think to withstand the king of Jehovah in the hand of the sons of David. Did you catch it? Why is it in the hands of the sons of David? Because it's David's kingdom that Jehovah bestowed on. It's Jehovah's kingdom that he gave to David as his possession on earth, which is why it's in the hands of his sons. Notice it didn't say the sons of Solomon. Solomon is dead at this time. You won't find it being referred to Solomon. And the throne of Solomon, the sons of Solomon sat on the throne of Solomon. No, it's the throne of David, the sons of David sitting on the throne of David. Do you know that? You're aware of this, right? You'll never find it read. And the sons of Solomon sat on the throne on behalf of Solomon. It's the throne of David, the sons of David sitting on David's throne. Second Chronicles 21, 7. I'm almost done with making these points. I have to do a part three on this. Second Chronicles 21, 7. You see how easy the truth is to defend if you know the truth and you're walking in the truth by the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes, Tomcat, I am rebutting and decimating the rabbis and their lies. Second Chronicles 21, verse 7. Watch here. Howbeit, Jehovah the Lord would not destroy the house of David. Why? Because of the covenant that he had made with David. And as he promised to give a light to him and to his sons forever. Did you catch it? The house of David, the covenant of David, and a light for David. Okay, so have I established 
from the Hebrew Bible, not the New Testament, the Hebrew Bible, that none of David's sons, not even Solomon in all his glory, could ever be David's Lord, Lord over David. None of them, right? None of them. Did I establish that? It's David's house, David's throne, David's kingdom that his sons sit on, on his behalf, in his place, as his heir. Luke S., why are you changing the subject and not focusing? See, this is what you're doing to yourself, which you're not going to benefit. You went on something else, so you confuse yourself and you're not learning. Can you stop that and focus for your sake? You got me there? Is that clear? So how can someone say David is writing it about Solomon? Not only does this butcher Jesus' words, it also butchers the context of the Hebrew Bible. No, medic. Friend, you're not listening, medic, to the promise. It's the covenant of David. What does the covenant of David have to do with prophets being sent from different tribes, unless you want to argue that prophets only came from David's line? The covenant that God made in which he would send prophets was made with all the tribes of Israel. This 2 Chronicles 21.7 is talking about the covenant of David. Are you now going to argue that prophets can only be from the line of David? How are they going to twist that, medic? Come on now. 2 Chronicles 21.7. The covenant with David, the promise to the house of David, he won't fail to have a light from among his sons. It's talking about the covenant with David, the covenant that said, my throne on earth is yours, my kingdom on earth is yours to rule, and when you die, your sons will then take your place in ruling my throne on earth. Thank you, Billy Mandalay, and better than these evangelical scholars who pay lip service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it clear so far? Okay, Okay, Bender, you know you're going to be blocked now, right? You're going to be sent on your merry way. Get rid of this guy. Another agent of Satan who doesn't want to focus. All right. So have we established that the Hebrew phrase, La Dawid, every time it's used in a psalm, always points to David authoring that psalm? We've established that, right? That was the first point. A psalm of David or of David, La Dawid, Anytime it's used in the psalm, nothing in the context which suggests it doesn't mean a, a psalm that David wrote. That's one. Number two, have we now established neither Solomon nor any human son of David, a son who's merely human, could ever be David's Lord. Therefore, David could not have been speaking of Solomon when he said, the Lord said to my Lord. Have I established the second point? Was that point established? Are you guys following me? Sahih Christian, I'm now live and I'm talking to you on the phone. You don't like it, get lost. I'm going to block you. Say something again, watch how I block you. So you just want to say, this guy's trying to be Christ-like. Anyway. Is that clear? Okay. What about some other human ruler? Maybe there's a human being that could be David's Lord. Let's go to Psalm 89, 19 to 20. Psalm 89, 19 to 20, and 26 to 27. Yes, you do. And you're here, Sai Christian. Captain Biocha, don't let me open up your black book, you little. Self-righteous Pharisee hypocrite. Mata being harsh. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet, pal. Psalm 89, 19 to 20. And by the way, this is a guy who's my friend. So imagine if I treat my friends like this, you're in good company. Psalm 89, 19 to 20 and 26 to 27. Okay. Can 
a human ruler be David's Lord. Guys, read with me. Psalm 89, 19 to 20, 26 to 27. Then thou spakest in vision to thy holy one and said, I have laid held upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of my people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. So he's talking about David. David, my holy one, I've anointed him. Now notice what he says about David, folks. 26 and 27. He shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Notice what God says about David. Andrew, everyone else, watch this. Also, I will make him, David, my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. Bam. We just ruled out any human being having greater authority than David. No human ruler was greater than David. So no human ruler could be David's Lord when David sat on the throne as king. No human son of David who's merely human could be his Lord. Did you catch what we just did? We now have eliminated from the accurate contextual interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. David speaking of a human being as his Lord, someone who's only human. No human son of David who's merely human could be his Lord, not even Solomon. And no human ruler could ever be greater than David because David was greater than them all in the eyes of God. You got it? Is everyone there? Uh, um, if you're confused, put a two because it's going to get good. It's going to get good by the power of the triune God. Okay. Now we're left with only two choices now. Either David is talking about a created spirit being, an angelic creature as his Lord, or he has to be talking about someone who's God. Was David referring to an angelic creature as his Lord? Absolutely not. And here's two lines of evidence. Are you ready? Number one, in the Hebrew Bible, according to the Hebrew Bible, Jehovah alone reigns in heaven on the throne and Jehovah alone is the Lord that Israel is to look to. The only Lord in heaven who sits on the throne, according to the Hebrew Bible, the only Lord that an Israelite looks to in heaven is Jehovah. They are not to look to a spirit creature, an angelic creature, as their Lord in heaven, because the only Lord in heaven that sits on the throne that Israel is to look to is Jehovah. Are you ready? For the proof? Are you ready for the proof? Let me repeat again. As far as the Hebrew Bible is concerned, the only Lord in heaven who sits on the throne that Israel looks to, including David, is Yahovah, Jehovah, the God of Israel. There is no one on the throne besides Jehovah, and all the spirit creatures are standing in service waiting to receive orders from Jehovah, nowhere in the Hebrew Bible, let me repeat so you don't misunderstand my argument, nowhere in the Hebrew Bible will you find anyone other than Jehovah seated on the throne in the Hebrew Bible. Let me repeat. No one other than Jehovah is seated on the throne in heaven in the Hebrew Bible. All the spirit creatures in heaven in the Hebrew Bible are standing in attention Waiting to receive orders. Psalm 103, 19 to 21. Psalm 103, 19 to 21. Read with me. And then I'm going to bring the New Testament to prove it. The Lord Yehovah hath prepared his throne in the heavens. And his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless Yehovah, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments. See, angels do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye, Yehovah, all ye hosts, ye ministers. What are they? Ministers. Servants of his that do his pleasure. Did you got, catch it? According to Psalm 103, 19 and 21. Who's seated, seated on the throne? Jehovah alone. Who's ministering before Jehovah, waiting to receive orders and commands? The angels. Did you guys see that? You guys see that or no? 
Okay. Psalm 123 verses 1 to 2. Psalm 123 verses 1 to 2. Psalm 103. I'm sorry. Yeah. What I say? Psalm 123 verses 1 to 2. Okay. Follow with me. Psalm 123 verses 1 to 2. I'm making a comprehensive case that David's Lord has to be God. A song of degrees unto thee. Lift up mine eyes, O that dwellest in the heavens. Notice, who do I look to in heaven? Unto thee. <clears throat> I lift up mine eyes, O that dwellest in heaven. <clears throat> Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon Yahovah, our God, until that he have mercy upon us. Did you catch it? I look to you, Jehovah in heaven, and you are our master, our Lord. Like earthly servants look to their earthly lords, we look to you, our Lord, who is in heaven on the throne, Jehovah. You see it? No one else besides Jehovah sits on a throne in the Hebrew Bible. So I'm going to repeat. In the Hebrew Bible... No one else besides Jehovah is seated on the throne in heaven. All the other beings who are created stand in attention, waiting to receive orders, which is why Israelites only look to Jehovah as their Lord in heaven. No one else. Okay. 1 Kings 22.19. 1 Kings 22.19. First Kings 22, 19. And he said, Hear thou, therefore, the word of Jehovah, Yehovah. I saw Jehovah sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand, on his left. Bam, folks. No one else is sitting in heaven except Jehovah. Did you catch it? Okay. Hold on. Hold on, I'm buffering. buffering. Okay. Guys, did you catch it? Okay, did you catch it? I saw Jehovah sitting and all the hosts of heaven, all the spirit creatures were standing to his right and left. So who alone sits in heaven according to the Hebrew Bible? Jehovah. All the other spirit creatures are standing. Who alone do the Israelites look to in heaven as Lord? Jehovah. Therefore, let me ask you the question. Could David refer to a spirit creature, an angelic creature, as his Lord, sitting at God's right hand, when you just read, all the hosts of heaven stand in attention, waiting to serve, and Jehovah alone is on the throne? Now, does the New Testament agree? Watch here. Does the New Testament agree? That angelic creatures are servants, not lords whom we serve. Does the New Testament agree? Angelic creatures are servants, not lords that we serve. Revelation 22, 8 to 9. Revelation 22, 8 to 9. Now you're going to see how amazing, how mind-blowing the argument of our Lord Jesus truly was. See, if you know your Bible, Jesus' argument was mind-blowing and irrefutable, if you know your Bible. Revelation 22, 8 to 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou, do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. I'm just a slave like you and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Bam. John, I'm an angelic creature. I'm a slave, a servant. That's it. Don't serve me. Worship God. Wow. Hebrews 1, 7 and 14. Now you're going to be amazed at the logic of Jesus's argument, the force of Jesus's argument. Truly, he's God Almighty in the flesh who cannot be refuted. Okay. 
Hebrews 1, 7 and 14. What does it say about angels? Hebrews 1, 7 and 14. And of the angels, he saith, about angels, he says, he makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Notice what angels are. An angel that's created is a minister, a servant. Hebrews 1, 14. Sorry, buffering. Okay. Okay, let's try this again. Notice Hebrews 1, 14. Are they not all ministering spirits, the spirits, angelic creatures? One second. All right. Am I back? Am I back? Sorry about that. In Jesus' name, we're almost done. Am I back? Okay. Did you read Hebrews 1.14? It says, the ministering spirits, the angelic creatures, spirits created, when we call angels, they're all ministers. And who do they minister to? Those who inherit salvation. So is it clear? Hebrews 1, 7 and 14, Revelation 22, 8 to 9, angelic creatures are spirits who serve, who are slaves, who minister and are not to be served. Is it clear? Did we make that point? Is it clear? If there's someone confused, put a two. Because we're almost done. I'm not going to stop until we're done with the session. Okay, now, but here's my question. Since no angelic creature can be David's Lord, no mere human creature can be David's Lord, no mere human descendant of David can be David's Lord, then we're left with only one. Only God can be David's Lord. And that's what David says, Psalm 16, verses 1 to 2. Only God can be David's Lord. Even though the word here he uses is Adonai, it's irrelevant whether it's Adonai or Adoni. Only God can be David's Lord. Let me prove it to you. Psalm 16, verses 1 to 2. Mikhtam of David, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto Jehovah, thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. Jehovah is my Lord. Even though it's Adoni, it's still the same point. You, Jehovah, are my Lord. Psalm 35, 23. Thank you, Glenn. I need the blessing. I'm almost done, folks. Bear with me. This will be the last session for a few days because I'm going to go to L.A., God willing, tomorrow. And maybe I'll do sessions there. So I want to make this count. Psalm 35, 23. Psalm 35, 23. This filthy dog, scum, son of Satan, has a name saying, the dude who bangs Shemunian's wife, not realizing she's not my wife, she's my ex, and he blasphemes because his prophet Muhammad was a filthy pig, a dog, son of Satan. Psalm 35, 23. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even to my cause, my God and my Lord. Someone came here with the name, the dude who bangs Shemunian's wife, even though she's my ex-wife. But, you know, this is a Mohammedan exemplifying the spirit that molested Muhammad. The same spirit that possessed Muhammad possesses him. Filthy dog, scum low life. What do you expect? He can't be better than his God or his prophet. Anyway, Psalm 35, 23. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Did you guys catch it? Did you guys catch it? David says to Jehovah, you are my Lord. You are my Lord and my God, my God and my Lord. No angelic creature can be David's Lord. No mere human son of David can be David's Lord. Yo, no human ruler can be David's Lord. David has only one Lord who reigns in heaven, Jehovah. Ilio, if you think I'm harsh, you'll be shocked if I quote the Bible and see what the prophets and the apostles did. Is it clear only Jehovah can be David's Lord? Do you see it? Is it clear only Jehovah can be David's Lord? Did you guys get it or no? But now we're confused. Let's go to Psalm 110.1. Here's where I'm confused, folks. Now you're going to see how amazing Jesus' argument is. Truly God in the flesh. And Psalm 110 is one of the most powerful proof texts for the multi-personal nature of God. If you know how to interpret Psalm 110, then you're going to see Psalm 110 
points to God being more than one person. God and the Messiah together make up the identity of God. So Jesus was absolutely right to use this psalm. But let's let's read. Please pay attention. I need you guys now to listen more than ever. Psalm 110 verse 1. A psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay, I'm confused. Here's Jehovah saying to David's Lord, you, David's Lord, sit at my, Jehovah's right hand. Hold on, David, you only have one Lord, especially in heaven. That's Jehovah. But you just said Jehovah's speaking to your Lord. What are you talking about, David? Jehovah is the only Lord you have in heaven. On earth, while you're a king, no son of yours, who's only human, can be your Lord. No human ruler can be your Lord. No angelic creature can be your Lord. Only Jehovah is your Lord. But David, you just have Jehovah, your Lord, speaking to your Lord. What are you doing, David? I thought Jehovah's only one. Yes, he is. But you have Jehovah speaking to your Lord, and the only Lord in heaven that rules over you is Jehovah. So Jehovah, your Lord, is speaking to someone who is your Lord. And David, hold on. You said that your Lord sits at Jehovah's right hand. But wait, isn't Jehovah in heaven? Yes. Psalm 2 verse 4. Let's look at it. Psalm 2 verse 4. Psalm 2 verse 4. Psalm 2 verse 4. Watch here. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Wait. Jehovah sits in heaven. Okay. Psalm 11 verse 4. Daily light. I don't know if you're blessing me or cursing me. Are you blessing me? I don't know. Hope you're blessing me. Hope you don't hate me that much. Psalm 11, 4. Where does Jehovah reign? Jehovah is in his holy temple. Jehovah's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold his eyelids try the children of men. Okay, did you catch it? Jehovah sits in throne in heaven. His throne is in heaven. Psalm 103, 19. Psalm 103, 19. Psalm 103, 19. Thank you, Daily Light. Thank you for the blessing. I need it. I really do. Now watch this. We're almost done. Andrew, are you following along too? You bless me every time you come. Psalm 103, 19. Watch here. Where is Jehovah seated? Psalm 103, 19. We're waiting. Before the rapture. Do -do -do -do. Do -do -do. Jehovah hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Okay, folks. Jehovah's in throne in heaven. Jehovah's throne is in heaven. He's preparing his throne in heaven. Okay, let me ask you a question. If Jehovah says to David's Lord, sit at my right hand, and Jehovah is in heaven, sitting on his throne, which is in heaven, where is David's Lord sitting? Where is David's Lord being invited to sit? On earth or in heaven on the same throne with Jehovah? Where is David's Lord being invited to sit? If Jehovah is enthroned in heaven and he says to David's Lord, sit at my right hand, where is J David's Lord? In heaven, right? On that throne, right? If we take Psalm 2-4, Psalm 11-4, Psalm 103-19, Jehovah is enthroned in heaven, and then Jehovah says to David's Lord, sit at my right hand, well, hold on, Jehovah, you're in heaven. For him to sit at your right hand means he's got to sit with you on the throne in heaven. Exactly. So you're inviting him to sit with you on the throne in heaven? Yes. But only Jehovah rules in heaven. Yes. So why are you inviting him to rule with you in heaven? Well, do the math. If only Jehovah sits in heaven, and I'm inviting David's Lord to sit at my right hand in heaven, that means David's Lord is also Jehovah, but he's distinct from me. So wait, Jehovah, you're saying there's another person who's also Jehovah, one with you? Yes, exactly. That's why Peter said what he said in Acts 2, 34 to 35. Let's see what Peter said when he quoted Psalm 110. Acts 2, 34, 35. Yep, exactly, Lopez. Acts 2, 34 to 35. Watch here. Almost done, man. I love this session. 
Acts 2, 34, 35. Now, folks, you understand why Peter said David himself did not enter heaven. For David is not ascended into heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Now, let me explain Peter's logic. You understand what Peter's saying? Guys, Jews, David never went to heaven, right? Yeah, he never did. But then he says, his Lord will sit with Jehovah on his right hand. So you see what Peter's doing? He's bringing out the logic of the psalm. If David's Lord is to sit with Jehovah on Jehovah's right hand, and Jehovah is in heaven, that means David's Lord has to go to heaven. And David never went to heaven, so it can't be about him. Do you see Peter's logic? I'm simply following Peter's logic. I didn't reason this out. Peter did, filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm still, I'm simply agreeing with Peter. You understand Peter's logic? He's saying to the Jews, wait, Jews. David never went into heaven. He died, yeah? But David's Lord will sit on Jehovah's right hand, yeah? But Jehovah's in heaven. Guess what that means? David's Lord must be in heaven. He must go to heaven. You see the logic? It's impeccable, isn't it? You see? So let's break it down so now you can appreciate Jesus' argument. Number one, no mere human descendant of David could be his Lord. No human ruler could be David's Lord. Number two, no angelic creature can be David's Lord because angels are servants subject to God and his people. Number three, the only Lord that David has in heaven is Jehovah, and he alone is on the throne according to the Hebrew Bible, and all the other angelic creatures are standing in attention waiting to serve. But number four, Jehovah says to David's Lord, sit at my right hand. And yet Jehovah's in heaven. That means David's Lord will sit with Jehovah in heaven. However, if only Jehovah is his Lord, then how can Jehovah be speaking to David's Lord when that means David's Lord is also Jehovah? So you have Jehovah speaking to Jehovah, but Jehovah's only one. And yet Jehovah's not speaking to himself. Jehovah's only one, but Jehovah's not speaking to himself. That means Psalm 110 is one of the most powerful witnesses to the fact that the one Jehovah is more than one person. And that's exactly Jesus' argument in Mark 12, 35 to 37. Let's go back and revisit it so we can tie it up. You catch it? That's why the Jews didn't answer Jesus. They knew the answer would be David's Lord had to be Jehovah, though distinct from Jehovah, which means that Jehovah is more than one person. That's why they didn't answer. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Random guy, can you get lost randomly? Because I already proved that Lord in this context means divine. Shut your mouth. Stop foaming at the mouth. Johnny, come lately. Exactly, Bill Mandeley. They were stunned because they understood his logic and they didn't want to go there. Because they would have to admit that the Messiah is God in the flesh. Mark 12, 35, 37. Now we appreciate Jesus' logic. Now you should be in awe of Jesus and his wisdom and his power. He truly is logic, wisdom, power in the flesh. Because for him to use Psalm 110 in this way, he saw something in the psalm that unfortunately, to their shame, even evangelical scholars don't see. And the reason why he saw it, because he's the God who revealed that psalm to David by his spirit. Now let's unpack it. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit revealed it to David about the Christ. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now notice Jesus' question. David therefore himself calls the Messiah Lord. He says, Christ is Lord. How then can he be a son? They didn't answer. You understand why? Because Jesus used the logic that I just broke down for you. If the Christ is only a human son of David, right? Then he can't be David's Lord. But David called the Christ my Lord because the Holy Spirit made it known to David, Messiah is your Lord. Hold on. Either then, 
the Messiah is not the son of David, or he's more than a son of David, he's more than human, he has to be God. Well, we know Messiah is the son of David, so that argument won't work. So the only choice is Messiah is a human son of David who's more than human, who's the God of David becoming flesh. So David's God became David's son to rule the throne for David as the God-man. That's Jesus' argument. Do you understand his argument? Andrew, do you understand what he's saying? If Messiah is only a human son of David, he can't be David's Lord. But David did call Messiah Lord. That means he has to be more than human. But the only Lord that David has who sits in heaven is Jehovah. So that means Messiah is Jehovah God who becomes the human son of David. But hold on. Another one speaks to David's Lord, and that other one is Jehovah. So Jehovah says to David's Lord, sit at my right hand. But the only Lord that David has in heaven is Jehovah. But here, David's Lord is the Messiah, a human son of David, showing that God would become a human descendant of David. And yet there's another speaking to David's God, who now became his son. And that other one is also Jehovah. But they're not two Jehovahs, because Jehovah's only one. But that one Jehovah is more than one person. It's God and the Messiah together. How many of you are blown away? How many of you are amazed at the depth, the power, the beauty, the consistency of the scriptures and Jesus' reasoning? Yes, Mickey, they did because no one refuted him. That's the point. No one said, no, it's not about Messiah. They walked away in shame. So this right now, okay, I will, Andrew, right here. Here's the first article, Andrew, and I'm going to put in the description section. Here you go. Andrew, save this. Here's, the, here's one, and here's the other. I have about over... Half a dozen articles on this. I'll put it in the description section. Okay, Andrew, I've just posted the first one. Here's the link to the second one. Andrew, did you see the logic and the force and the consistency of the argument that even the Hebrew Bible prepared Israel for the fact that the God of Israel is more than one person, and one of those persons would become the Messiah, the son of David? Clear? I got to sneeze. Thank you, Andrew. You bless me when you come. I look forward to you when you come. Guys, God willing, I'm flying out tomorrow to L.A. I'm gone for two weeks. Part of the reason I'm going, I'm going to do 26 pre-recorded episodes, Lord willing, for Al-Fadi TV. Pray for anointing. Pray for health, safety. Pray God will fill me with the Spirit. Pray God will keep my daughters healthy and protect them. Pray God fights my battles in court and saves me. Pray for divine appointments, Lord willing. And while I'm there, I'll see if I, I can live stream. If I will, I'll announce it on my social media pages, meaning Facebook. So Lord willing, sometime next week, I may live stream. But keep praying. I'm also going to visit a lot of Syrians I haven't seen in years. Pray for a fruitful time, a time that God will refresh me, strengthen me, and fill me. And pray for that appointment. Remember, I said I have someone in mind. If it's of the Lord, ask God to show me and confirm it maybe in this upcoming trip, right? But until then... Smash the like button. Watch this over again. Watch all these previous sessions over again. Send the links out. Study the arguments. Study the argu articles. Absorb them. Make them your own. And use it in the power of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus until every knee bows and every tongue confesses Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. Bless us. Preserve us. Cover us by your blood. Cover my children by your blood and bless Andrew, Lord Jesus. Put a fire in his heart to desire you and ache for you and return to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you're in L.A., contact me. I'd love to visit you one-on-one. -on -one, or if you want me to come to your Bible study to teach, I'm available. Use me.
Yes, Romans, I will. Christ is risen, right? Risen indeed. I hope you're blessed. Were you guys blessed and amazed and blown away? How deep, how beautiful, how amazing the scriptures are, how real our God is, and that Jesus is God in the flesh. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord bless you. See you soon. Pray for traveling mercies and for my daughter's protection. Take care.